Plutarch's Life of Phocion. Who the hell is this guy? This guy was an Athenian statesman. He lived to hear about the death of Philip, the death of Alexander, and the death of Alexander's successor, Antipater. He also lived to hear about the death of Demosthenes and Hyperides before he himself was sentenced to death and poisoned. The life of Phocion in many ways, it, it, it ends almost with a godfather style climax of death. So let's get started with this life. There's a very interesting early paragraph that seems to provide multi-generational wisdom from Plutarch that just applies to every single age. Let, let's just get this line. It is commonly said that public bodies are most insulting and contumelious to a good man when they are puffed up with prosperity and success. But the contrary often happens. Afflictions and public calamities, naturally embittering and souring the minds and tempers of men, and disposing them to such peevishness and irritability that hardly any word or sentiment of common vigor can be addressed to them, but they will be apt to take offense. He that remonstrates with them on their errors is presumed to be insulting over their misfortunes, and any free-spoken expostulation is construed into contempt. Let's, let's deal with these lines. The idea that it's impossible to reason with an emotional person, and to be blunt with an emotional, an emotional person, that finds its echo in, Ray, in Jean Racine's Britannicus. Uh, there's a scene in uh, Act 1, Scene 2, just at the end, when Burris is talking to Agrippina, and, and Agrippina is Nero's mother. And what Burris says is this, Lady, I see it's time I held my tongue, and that my bluntness now begins to jar. Grief is unjust, and every argument which does not pander to it heightens it. Okay, so that's from Jean Racine. He seems to agree. This idea that people who are going through a period of grief or who are otherwise emotional can't be leveled with. Now, I have wondered about the Dryden translation uh, ever since the life of Coriolanus, where I compared the Dryden translation with the Bernadotte Perrin translation. And Plutarch uses the word demos repeatedly. Demos is the word for people. It's where we get the word democracy, rule of the people, demos. What is interesting about the life of Coriolanus is that John Dryden translates demos very frequently as multitude, whereas Perrin translates it as people. And it seems to me that to, say, to call them the multitude gives it a more anti-populist slant, and that Dryden, therefore, we can read his translations as bringing a more anti-popular, anti-societal sentiment than parents. And I've wondered if Dryden doesn't make Plutarch more anti-popular than he is. But for this particular sentence, I looked up some of these ancient Greek words, and I actually think in this instance, neither Dryden nor Perrin is as scolding, as disapproving, and as scornful as the people, as the original Plutarch is. So I want to look at some of these words. Let's start with the word that Dryden translates as remonstrates, epitomon. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but that's the word that Dryden translates as remonstrates, Perrin translates it as censures. Now, if, now, as we move on to what Plutarch actually said and what that word means, we must remember that the essence of this sentence is that these people, the people are going to be offended by a thing. Their offense is more ridiculous the slighter the thing is. So if we compare Perrin with Dryden, we see Perrin goes, goes easiest on the population. To be censured, we, we don't like being censured. So Perrin goes the easiest on the people. Remonstrates, a little softer than to censure. All right, so Dryden is a little tougher on the people. But Plutarch, epitomon is very close to this word epitomeo. And it carries with it not just this notion of blame, it does carry an, an implication of blame with it. But according to the ancient, the classic um, uh, Greek dictionary I looked at, it carries with it a double meaning of uh, to appraise, to assess, to set a value at. So this word is actually a softer word in Greek. Plutarch is saying that these people are taking offense at a mere assessment, a mere appraisal of their actions. 
Never mind remonstrating, never mind censuring. So Plutarch is the toughest of the three. The original Plutarch is tougher. Let's continue with this next word. The next Greek word I want to mention is exomartinomenes. Again, I know I can't pronounce this. I think it's according to Google Translate's pronunciation thing. Exomartinomenes. Now I looked into the root words. Now I have to offer a disclaimer. I'm not a Greek classicist. I've never taken any course in ancient Greek. And this word's brutal to translate. It is a composite of two different Greek words. What they may have meant by it is tough to know. So there's my disclaimer. I'm just taking a guess. Do not, if you're a student, do not rely on this in some kind of term paper or something. It is from this one word that Perrin gives us the them and our choice of transgressions in the Perrin and errors in, in the Dryden. But, the, but the, the subject of the sentence, the, the word being modified, is translated as them. No, no. I, I, both the translators have dodged something here. Uh, in my amateur opinion, I think the actual literal meaning for this was something closer to the votaries of error, to adherents of folly, something closer to that. The first part of that word, exomartia, the Follett's classic Greek dictionary translated that as error. But that second word, that tumen, tumen, tumenunus, whatever the hell it is, in the dictionary, that is close to something like votary. That's where I'm getting that. But I think that it, because it was a composite word, it was very difficult to translate. And so both Dryden and Perrin took, took the softer route, quite understandably, because that's kind of a bold statement to be wrong on, right? That That's how Plutarch uh, sounded. And of course, now dealing with the substance of what is being said, it's an interesting thing to say, even if we just deal with the, the expert translators. It's an interesting thing to say, the idea that a leader cannot level with the people that is going through grief and that is emotional. They cannot hear the truth and they cannot be reasoned with. You must pander the, to them to some extent. And as Plutarch continues to write, there is a balance to be achieved in just how earnest you can be, how forthcoming you can be, that you must mitigate it. And as Plutarch goes on to say, that's no easy, he, he understands, easier said than done is what Plutarch says. It's really hard. It's hard to level with the grieving people. Now, what, what I think is interesting to turn that on its head is there seems, if that statement, if we accept that statement as a, a given and a rule that emotional people cannot be reasoned with, doesn't it, doesn't it kind of also follow that therefore a, a people that is emotional are ripe to be told a lie that people who are going who are highly agitated and emotional those are the people who are prepared to swallow a lie provided that it is, it is the right lie and that if you therefore are a politician who's interested interested in effectuating an outcome doesn't it serve you to some extent to keep the people in a constant state of agitation and emotion that way they are always prepared to swallow a lie just some food for thought. Let's move on. We find out that Phokian's mentor is this guy, Chabrius, uh, who was a general. And take these lines about, about Chabrius. In the heat of battle, he used to be so fired and transported that he threw himself headlong into danger beyond the forest, which indeed, in the end, cost him his life in the island of Chios, he having pressed his own ship foremost to force a landing. It is incredible how in just that one sentence, we can get a, a feel for the type of man that Chabrius was. It's one of the great things about, about Plutarch and about very succinct, succinct quick uh, summarizing writing. I, th I, I felt the same way about uh, the Brothers Grimm and the same compliment has been given to Daniel Defoe. How, how much we can glean without over description. So we get an idea of Chabrius. Very, sounds like Custer's last stand. So much of the story of the life of Phokian centers around... Um, the politics and the, the varying arguments between the Athenian politicians between appeasement and open hostility against the Macedonian um, peoples. And it seems that Phokion, Phokion was for peace. Demosthenes and Hyperides were for war. There's something to be said uh, by way of comparison of the Macedonian Empire under Philip and Alexander and the... French Empire under Napoleon and the difficulties in Prussia in particular in 
what the correct policy was. There was a, in the age of Napoleon, there was a similar issue. Prussia didn't know what the hell to do. And what are you supposed to do when you are the weaker state against the stronger state and war clearly benefits them more than you? What is, what is your bargaining power? And that seems to have been an issue. But one of the great things is we get examples of Phokion's wit as these arguments um, are being made. There's this one, one example of Demosthenes. Demosthenes, in addressing Phokion, he says, The Athenians, Phokion, will kill you someday when they once are in a rage. Phokion responded by saying, And you, if they once are in their senses. Yeah, that's a pretty good comeback. Then there's, another, then there's another moment when one of the um, orators is arguing to go to war, and apparently he's a very fat person, and he starts to sweat, and Phokion apparently is not above pointing that out, saying, here indeed is a fit man to lead us into a war. He's not above a nice ad hominem attack, nothing like a good direct insult. There's another, there's another guy who's got a beard, and he tells him to shave right on the floor. So Phokion's a guy who's, who must have been amusing to watch arguing. Uh, in public. Uh, other bits of cultural amusement. There's a line where Plutarch tells us that even to this day, this day meaning Plutarch's day, that Phokion's house at Melita was shown, even though the only thing that adorned the walls were these very plain copper plates. Now, Plutarch offers this to show us just how humbly Phokion lived. But to me, it's almost funny to think that even in the uh, second century, people were going on boring house tours and <laughs> looking at these god-awful copper plates. And, and then there's this description of his son, Phocus. A, the youth being in a general way a lover of drinking and ill-regulated in his habits. Ill-regulated in his habits. It sounds like a code for the kid jerks off too much. Euphemistic language. Oh, so how's your son turning out? Ooh, he's a little ill-regulated at the moment. It's something to show on the house tour. This is where Focus used to masturbate. When they do go to war with the Macedonians, I guess suffice it to say, Athens loses. Phokion wins his battle, but Athens loses. It, it seems to me like it is perfectly possible that the Athenians got some early militaristic headway in this war precisely because the Macedonian Empire was stretched thin across Asia uh, and a little overextended by Alexander's exploits. And we read in a few lines that more and more Macedonian armies are sort of trickling back in um, from Asia and the Athenians just can't deal with them all. And they, they, they lose. And it will be in the aftermath in this piece where we will see the downfall of so many Athenians including Phokion himself. So what happens first, under the terms of the peace, is they have to give up Demosthenes and Hyperides, and this leads to their deaths. Both of them are sentenced to death and then flee the city. Demo Demosthenes kills himself. Hyperides is tracked down by the, by the Macedonians and killed. The other part of this, this sort of bloodbath at the end that I told you about is... The Athenians had to pay reparate. They had to pay a, a tribute sum to Macedonia that Phokion actually endeavored to delay and postpone. The other part is the placement of this Macedonian gar garrison at the at the hill town of Monikia, and the Athenians hated this, and they decided that they wanted to send a deputation to the Macedonians in order to ask that this garrison be removed. This is this is them kind of wanting to thwart this peace they send this guy Demades along with his son and here we get the description so Cassander is of the Macedonians and he is in charge at Monikia Cassander saw him come he seized him and first brought out the son and killed him so close before his face that the blood ran all over his clothes and person. And then, after bitterly taunting and upbraiding him with his ingratitude and treachery, dispatched him himself. What next, what next happens is this guy Polyspersion, who was a, who was a general-in-chief after Antipater dies. Which, by the way, let's... What was the structure of, of Macedonian politics? That sounds like a military dictatorship. One person at the top dies, and all these generals sort of move up the ladder. That's what it looks like here. When Antipater dies, Cassander, Polysperkin, and this guy Nisenor all rise in rank. Very, 
Isn't that like Soviet style? Not that I, I don't know much about the Soviet Union. That sounds like a military dictatorship is what it sounds like. So the Macedonians want to establish a pretext for yet another war. And that's what Polly Spurkin tries to do. But that's going to be difficult because the only remaining politician in Athens that has any weight is Phokion. And Phokion is always clamoring for peace. So they need to find a way to remove him. And so they pull this stunt where they send a letter, Polly Spurkin sends a letter to the Athenians that he intends uh, to restore them their old democratic rights and privileges. And the people of Athens actually believe what's in this letter. They have just seen Demades and his son go on a deputation in which, which they are murdered by the Macedonians. And then the Macedonians come promising democracy for them and they believe this it's really ridiculous like i can't believe this <laughs> how dumb these people are so this letter is believed and they arrange for this kind of summit in piraeus and at this summit of course something goes wrong phokian is charged with the safety of this guy nisanor and his safety is placed in jeopardy and this guy nisanor leaves and it, so the macedonians blame phokian for attempting to apprehend him. And it seems like the Athenians blame him for failing to apprehend him. Very bizarre mix-up. So the the Macedonians come and march on Athens, and they dig, dig trenches around Piraeus. And, and, and Phokion is charged. Brought to the city and charged. And, and here's the description of this moment in Plutarch. The manner of conveying them was indeed extremely moving. They were carried in chariots through the Ceramicus straight to the place of Judicature, where Cletus secured them till they had convoked an assembly of the people which was open to all comers. Every respectable citizen at the sight of Phokion covered up his face and stooped down to conceal his tears, and one of them had the courage to say that since the king had committed so important a cause to the judgment of the people, it would be well that the strangers and those of servile condition should withdraw, but the populace would not endure it, crying out they were oligarchs and enemies to the liberty of the people and deserved to be stoned, after which no man durst offer anything further in Phokian's behalf. Remember the words of Burke against the French Revolution, that the mind of an inquirer might be subdued by the sight of of a whole people collected into a focus. It, they are so incensed at him that there are some who want to bring out the... I always thought the rack was a medieval torture device. Apparently, it, the rack predated the Middle Ages, and they had it in Greece. Someone wanted to bring out the rack and torture Phokian first. They didn't do that, and they brought Phokian into a dungeon and poisoned him. And that's how Phokian dies. There's this great line, his widow. This is what, this is what she says when she, she buries him. Blessed hearth. To your custody I commit the remains of a good and brave man, and I beseech you, protect and restore them to the sepulchre of his fathers when the Athenians return to their right minds.